Hello, welcome back. We are going to discuss Resolution and Independence written by William Wordsworth. This poem is also titled Leech Gatherer for the protagonist, apart from the speaker, uh, is also a leech gatherer. Uh, in this particular lecture, I would like to read the text and then I would love to discuss the text on the structural and then followed by the thematic aspects of it. Um, while reading the text, I'll be uh, looking very carefully into the enjambments and uh, follow through the sentences or grammaticality for the sake of comprehension rather than reading it just for the sake of poetry or line's sake. So while uh, reading the text, please pardon me for, uh, for not uh, being linear to the metricalities of the poem. And uh, we shall discuss those aspects of structure while we discuss about the structure and thematic aspects while we discuss about the theme. So initially, we shall go to the reading of the text, Resolution and Independence by William Wordsworth. This particular poem is a bit longer one. There are 20 stanzas of seven lines each. So it's about 140 lines to be read. So be patient and let's go ahead. You may also read along with me because I shall go very slow and steady so that you could follow me on the way. There was a roaring in the wind all night. The rain came heavily and fell in floods. But now the sun is rising calm and bright. The birds are singing in the distant woods. Over his own sweet voice, the stock dove broods. The jay makers answer as magpies chatter, and all the air is filled with pleasant noise of waters. All things that love the sun are out of doors. The sky rejoices in the morning's birth. The grass is bright with raindrops. On the moors, the hare is running, running races in her mirth, and with her feet, she from the Flashy earth raises a mist that glittering in the sun runs with her all the way wherever she doth run. I was a traveler then upon the moor. I saw the hare that raced about with joy. I heard the woods and distant waters roar or heard them not as happy as a boy. The pleasant season did my heart employ. My old remembrances went from me wholly and all the ways of men so vain and melancholy. But as it sometimes chanced from the night of joys in the minds that can no further go, as high as we have mounted in delight, in our dejection do we sink as low, to me that morning did it happen so, and fears and fancies thick upon me came, dim sadness and blind thoughts I knew not, nor could name. I heard the skylark wobbling in the sky, and I bethought me of the playful hair. Even such a happy child of earth am I, even as these blissful creatures do I fare, far from the world I walk and from all care. But there may come another day to me, solitude, pain in heart, distress and poverty. My whole life I have lived in pleasant thought, as if life's business were a summer's mood, as if all needful things would come unsoughtful, Sorry, I'll retake this particular stance. My whole life I have lived in pleasant thought, as if life's business were a summer's mood, as if all needful things would come unsought to genial faiths, still rich in genial good. But how can he expect that others should build for him? So for him, and at his call, love him, who for himself will take no heed at all. 
I thought of Chatterton, the marvelous boy, the sleepless soul that perished in his pride, of him who walked in glory and in joy, following his plough along the mountainside. By our own spirits are we defied. We poets in our youth begin in gladness, but thereof come in the end despondency and madness. Now, whether it were by peculiar grace, a leading from above, a something given, yet it befell that in this lonely place, when I with these untoward thoughts had striven, beside a pool bare to the eye of heaven, I saw a man before me, unaware. The oldest man he seemed that ever wore gray hairs. As a huge stone is sometimes seen to lie couched on a bald top of an eminence, wonder to all who do the same spy, by what means it could neither come and whence, so that it seems a thing induced with sense, like a sea beast crowled forth, that on a shelf of rock or sand reposed there to sun itself, such seemed this man, not all alive, nor dead, nor all asleep. In his extreme old age, his body was bent double, feet and head coming together in life's pilgrimage, as if some dire constraint, constraint of pain or rage of sickness felt by him in times long past, a more than human weight upon his frame had cast. Himself he proposed, Himself he propped limbs, pro body and pale face upon a long grey staff of shaven wood and still as I drew near with gentle pace upon the margin of the Moorish land, a Moorish flood, uh, motionless as a cloud, the old man stood that heard not the loud winds when they call and moved altogether if it move at all. At length, himself unsettling, he the pond stirred with his staff, and fixed did look upon the muddy water, which he coned as if he had been reading in a book. And now a stranger's privilege I took, and drawing to his side, to him did I did say, this morning gives us promise of a glorious day. A gentle answer did the old man make. In, in counter speech, which forth he slowly drew, and him with further words I thus bespake, What occupation do you dare pursue? This is a lonesome place for one like you. Ere he replied, a flash of mind surprise broke from a sable orbs of his yet vivid eyes. His words came feebly from a feeble chest, but each in solemn order followed each, with something of the lofty utterance dressed, choice words and measured phrase above the reach of ordinary men, a stately speech, such as grave livers do in Scotland use, religious men who give to God and man their dues. He told that to these waters he had come to gather leeches. Being old and poor, 
unemployed, unemployment hazardous and uh, wearisome and he had many hardships to endure. From pond to pond he roamed, from moor to moor, housing with God's good help, by choice or chance, and in this way he gained an honest maintenance. The old man still stood talking by my side, but now his voice to me was like a stream scarce heard, nor word from word could I divide. And the whole body of the man did seem like one whole I had met with in a dream. Or like a man from some far region sent to give me human strength by apt admonishment. My former uh, thought returned. The fear that kills and hope that is unwilling to be fed cold, pain and labor and all flashy, uh, fleshy ills and mighty poets in their misery dead, perplexed and longing to be com comforted. My question eagerly did I renew, how is it that you live and what is it you do? He with a smile did then his words repeat and said that gathering leeches, Far and wide he travelled, stirring thus about his feet and waters of the pools where they abide. Once I could meet with them on every side, but they have dwindled long by slow decay, uh, yet still I persevere and find them where I may. While he was Talking thus, the lonely place, the old man's shape and speech, all troubled me. In my mind's eye, I seemed to see him pace about the weary moors continually, wandering about alone and silently. While I these, while I these thoughts within myself pursued, he, having made me pause, the same discourse renewed, and soon. With this, he other matter blended, cheerfully uttered with denimor kind, but stately in the man, in the main, and when he ended, I could have laughed myself to scorn to find in that discrepant man so firm a mind. God, said I. Be my help and stay secure. I'll think of the leech gatherer on the lonely moor. Thank you for listening. We shall come back and discuss the structure and the thematic aspects of the text.